good good morning to you. Good morning online. It's good to see you. Good to be with you this morning and uh, to declare to us that Jesus is alive. And um, it's going to be a little bit of a different message today. Um, You might not come back to church after this message, but... Uh, or you might really, really, really get back to church after this message. But uh, there's so much power in the resurrection. And uh, on that day, when he was risen from the dead, Matthew says this, Matthew 27, and the tombs were opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And, the, and coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. We think it's the power just of Jesus being raised from the dead, but the power of God, the Spirit of God who raised Christ from the dead, who lives in you, who gives life to your mortal body, can you imagine the seismic shift that happened in that moment that those who were in the graves, can you imagine family members that day? Can you imagine some guys that didn't leave well that day? It's like, I'm back. Can you imagine the stir in the city on that day? There was a stir with the Jewish leaders. There was a stir with the centurions and the guards and those who ran away when they saw the rumbling. But can you imagine the city on that day? The city experienced something quite profound when Jesus was crucified. And in the temple, the curtain was torn and ripped. That the presence of God would no longer be contained for one man to go into the presence of God one time in a year. But the presence of God would no longer be contained because our Christ is risen. And you and I, receive the very gift of righteousness because of the resurrection. You and I get the right standing with the Father because of the resurrection. And it was God's good pleasure to see that his son would get everything that he paid for. Can you imagine that day, that moment, that seeing those that had already perished come and visit the city again? What would it look like for you and I. Our lives are dependent on the resurrection. And today I'm gonna read a pretty large portion of scripture uh, from the message in 1 Corinthians 15. Go and read 1 Corinthians 15. You know, the, the Bible speaks about the resurrection of the dead as a foundation of our faith. Many people don't know our foundations or the foundations of your faith that you'll find in Hebrews. And the foundations of your faith, there's six foundations ultimately that you and I should be really established in because it's a platform of how we build and how we grow and how we go. It's uh, repentance from dead works and then faith towards God, that your works and your own ability are not gonna save you, but it's faith in God and what God did in Christ in reconciling the world back to himself, not counting our sins against us. That's faith toward God and then doctrine of baptisms and laying on of hands and then resurrection of dead and eternal judgment. Those are the foundations of our faith. And if you have read through the book of Hebrews, you would find that and want to go and study it. And we're going to release the foundations of faith course here uh, after the holidays in May. But in 1 Peter 3, I do have a couple of scriptures that are going to go up. In 1 Peter 1 verses 3, Peter says this, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And not only that, and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, this inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. And how you and I enter into the kingdom of God, how our salvation is secure, we see it in Romans 10, verse 9 and 10. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified or made righteous, and with the mouth one 
confesses and is saved. It's one thing to believe what Jesus did in his death, but our belief is sealed and it becomes a guarantee when you believe in the resurrection of the dead and that Christ is alive. Your hope and your faith is reliant upon that. Uh, George, can I get my water, please? So I'm gonna read quite a long portion of scripture. You can follow it. I'm gonna read in the message. I'm not gonna read everything. I'm gonna break it up into portions because there are 58 verses. So if you can put that up, are we winning? Oh, wonderful. Thanks, guys. They told me there's 72 slides because of the way they've set it up. Okay, Brands, let's read together. This is Paul speaking, and he's speaking about this thing of the resurrection and our resurrection, and then the final meeting when Jesus returns. 1 Corinthians 1.15, it says, Friends, let me go over the message with you one final time. This message that I proclaimed, that you made your own, this message on which you took your stand and by which your life has been saved. I'm assuming now that your belief was the real thing and not a passing fancy, that you're in this for good and holding fast. The first thing I did was place before you what was placed emphatically before me, that the Messiah died for our sins exactly as the scripture tells it, and that he was buried and that he was raised from the death on the third day, again exactly as the scripture says. That he presented himself alive to Peter and then to his closest followers and later to more than 500 of his followers all at the same time, most of them still around, although a few have since died. That he then spent time with James and the rest of those he commissioned to represent him. And then finally, he presented himself alive to me. It was fitting that I bring up the rear. This is Paul speaking. I don't deserve to be included in that inner circle. As you well know, I've spent all those early years trying my best to stamp out God's church right out of existence. But because God was so gracious, so very generous, here I am. And I, I'm not about to let his grace go to waste. Haven't I worked hard trying to do more than any of these others? Even then, my work didn't amount to all that much. It was God giving me the work to do, God giving me the energy to do it. So whether you heard it from me or from those others, all, it's all the same. We spoke God's truth and you entrusted your lives. Now let me ask you something profound yet troubling. If you became believers because you trusted the pro- pro- proclamation that Christ is alive, risen from the dead, how can you let people say that there's no such thing as a resurrection? If there's no resurrection, there's no living Christ, and face it. If there's no resurrection for Christ, everything we've told you is smoke and mirrors, and everything you've staked your life on is smoke and mirrors. Not only that, but we would be guilty of telling you a string of barefaced lies about God. All these affidavits we passed on to you, verifying that God raised up Christ, sheer fabrications, if there's no resurrection. If corpses can't be raised, then Christ wasn't because he was indeed dead. And if Christ wasn't raised, then all you're doing is wandering about in the dark as lost as ever. It's even worse for those who died hoping in Christ and resurrection because they are already in their graves. If all we get out of Christ is a little inspiration for a few short years, we're a pretty sorry lot. But the truth is that Christ has been raised up the first in a long legacy of those who are gonna leave the cemeteries. There's a nice symmetry in this death initially came by a man and resurrection from death came by a man. Everybody dies in Adam, everybody comes alive in Christ. But we have to wait our turn. Christ is first, then those with him at his coming, the grand consummation when after crushing the opposition, he hands over his kingdom to God the Father. He won't let up until the last enemy is down. And the very last enemy is death. As the psalmist said, he laid them low, one and all, 
He walked all over them. When Scripture says he walked all over them, it's obvious that he couldn't at the same time be walked on. When everything and everyone is finally under God's rule, the son will step down, taking his place with everyone else, showing that God's rule is absolutely comprehensive, a perfect ending. And why do you think I keep risking my neck in this dangerous work? I look death in the face practically every day I live. Do you think I'd do this if I wasn't convinced of your resurrection and mine as guaranteed by the resurrected Messiah Jesus? Do you think I was just trying to act heroic when I fought wild beasts in Ephesus, hoping it wouldn't end and it wouldn't be the end of me? Not on your life, it's resurrection, resurrection, always resurrection that undergirds what I do and say and the way I live. If there's no resurrection, we eat, we drink, the next day we die, and that's all there is to it. But don't fool yourselves. Don't let yourselves be poisoned by this anti-resurrection loose talk. Bad company ruins good manners. Think straight. Awaken to the holiness of life. No more playing fast and loose with this resurrection facts. Ignorance of God is a luxury you can't afford in times like these. Aren't you embarrassed that you've let this kind of thing go on as long as you have? And then I'm gonna skip down to verse 52. You hear a blast to end all blasts from a trumpet. And then the time that you look up and in a blink of your eyes, it's over. On signal from that trumpet from heaven, the dead will be up and out of their graves beyond the reach of death, never to die again. At that so moment, in the same way, we'll all be changed. In the resurrection scheme of things, this has to happen. Everything perishable taken off the shelves and replaced by the imperishable. This mortal replaced by the immortal. Then the saying will come true, death swallowed by triumphant life. Who got the last word, O death? O death, who's afraid of you now? It was sin that made death so frightening. The law, co the law code guilt that gave sin its leverage, its destructive power. But now, in a single victorious stroke of life, all three, sin, guilt, death, are gone. The gift of our master, Jesus Christ. Thank God. And verse 58, Paul says, with all this going for us, my dear, dear friends, stand your ground, don't hold back, throw yourself into the work of the master, confident that nothing you do for him is a waste of time. Or effort. Every single year we hear messages on Easter of a resurrection life, of resurrection power. Has it changed you? I want to speak about a couple of guys who had changed and they did some things and uh, they lost their lives in the process. Our world has changed. We, uh, we're safer in our world from the persecution that comes against us. Persecution comes in different forms. Persecution comes from laws changing that we can't do certain things and law changes uh, against some of our morals or morality or what we view as our values or what we hold to. But some of these guys in the beginning, they lived a life understanding and knowing what resurrection power was, what the resurrection life represented. You see, we got victory at the resurrection. We're gonna have victory at the end. But you and I have still got a job to do. So welcome to today's resurrection message. Here are a few believers that knew the resurrection was true and knew that nothing you do for him was a waste of time and effort. Friends, my message to you today is nothing you do for him is a waste of time and effort. It was a guy named Stephen. Now Stephen preached to those who crucified Jesus as, and were stoned for his time and his efforts. Saul, who Paul was writing in Corinthians, he was endorsing that stoning at the time. We immediately told by Luke that there was a great persecution against the church which was at Jerusalem and that they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, but the apostles stayed there. About 2,000 Christians at that time 
with one of the de deacons, Nicanor, suffered martyrdom during the persecution that arose about Stephen because he believed something. Then there's a guy, his name's James, surname Zebedee. James was led to the place of martyrdom. His accuser was brought to repent of his conduct by the apostles' extraordinary courage and unwavering faith and fell down at his feet to request his pardon, professing himself a Christian and resolving that James should not receive the crown of martyrdom alone. Hence, they were both beheaded at the same time for their time and their effort. Thus did the first apostolic martyr cheerfully and resolutely receive that cup which he had told our Savior he was ready to drink. Then there was Philip. Philip had four daughters. Philip, he lay, labored diligently in Upper Asia and suffered martyrdom at Heriopolis in Perga, was scourged, thrown into prison, and afterwards crucified. Welcome to Resurrection Sunday. Then there was Matthew. The scene of his labors was Parthia and Ethiopia, in which latter country he suffered martyrdom, being sla slain with a, a halberd. Now, a halberd is a spear, and it's got an axe attached to it. It's very long. So they either can give you this way, or they can give you that way. But pretty much came from Germany, that um, a halberd. Combined spear and battle axe in the city of Nadaba. Then there was James. And they called James Camel Knees because when they found him dead, they saw that his knees had huge calluses on them. And they called him Camel Knees because he spent most of his time on his knees praying for the church. Listen to this story. He was elected to the oversight of the churches in Jerusalem and was the author of the epistle James. At the age of 94, there's no retirement, ladies and gentlemen. At the age of 94, he was beaten, stoned by the Jews, thrown from the temple, and finally had his brains dashed out with a fuller's club. Then there's Matthias. Now, Matthias, we don't hear much about him, but he got picked in Judas's place after Judas denied Jesus. So we don't hear much of his life in the Bible, but we see much of his death. Matthias, of whom less is known than most of the other disciples, was elected to fill the vacant place of Judas. He was stoned at Jerusalem and then beheaded. We don't hear about his life, but we do know what his life was about in his death. Andrew was a brother of Peter. He preached the gospel to the Asiatic nations, but on his arrival at Edessa, southeast Turkey, he was taken and crucified on a cross the two ends of which were fixed transversely in the ground. It's called St. Andrew's cross. It was a cross this way. And then they stuck those two pieces in the ground and they put you frontwards. They lashed you and they turned you around. They lashed you again until you died. Then there was Peter. Then there was Mark. Mark was dragged to pieces by the people of Alexandra. The great ceremony of Serapis, their idol, ending his life under their merciless hands. Peter was crucified, his head being down at his feet, himself requiring, because he said he was unworthy to be crucified the same form and manner as his Lord was. Then there's Paul. Paul the apostle, who before was called Saul, overseeing Stephen's death, after his great travail and unspeakable labors in promoting the gospel of Christ, suffered also in the first persecution under Nero. The writer declared that under his execution, Nero sent two of his esquires or lawyers, Ferrega and Parthimus, to bring him word of his death. They, coming to Paul while instructing the people, desired him to pray for them. This is such a good way to go. Desired him to pray for them that they might believe who told them that shortly after they should believe and be baptized in his pool. This done, other soldiers came, led him out of the city to the place of his execution, where after his prayers were made, he gave his neck to the sword. All because of the resurrection. Jude, the brother of James, was commonly called Thaddeus, was crucified 
in southeast Turkey. Bartholomew preached in several countries, having translated the gospel of Matthew into the language of India. He propagated it in that country. He was at length cruelly beaten and then crucified by the impatient idolaters. Thomas, called Didymus, preached the gospel in Parthia and India when, while exciting the rage of pagan priests, he was martyred by the thrust through with a spear. Luke, the evangelist and the doctor, was the author of the gospel which goes under his name. He traveled with Paul through various countries and was hanged on an olive tree by the idolatrous priests of Greece. Simon, you guys are like, when's this gonna end? <laughs> it might not. That's right, you're getting the picture, aren't you? Simon, surnamed Zealotus, preached the gospel in Mauritania, Africa, and even Britain, in which later country he was crucified. Barnabas was of Cyprus, but of Jewish descent. His death was supposed to have taken place in AD 73, and yet, notwithstanding all these continual persecutions and horrible punishments, the church daily increased. Deeply rooted in the doctrine of the apostles, mainly the death burial and resurrection of Jesus. This happened after the resurrection. And if we can put the scripture up, please, in Acts 1, verse 1 to 8. Luke, before he was killed, he penned this book, the book of Acts. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach. Until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. What made these men do what they did? They heard they saw, they touched, they witnessed. They couldn't help themselves but share this message. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked, Lord, are you at this time gonna restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it's not for you to know the times or dates the Father has sent by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. These disciples lived from this place. See, friends, for the church in this next dispensation or time or season that we get to live in, we have to go back to the place of living in and through the Holy Spirit and His power and His leading and His guiding. The church has still got the voice, the only voice on planet earth, but it takes you and I. Are we willing in this place of safety where there's no persecution, are you willing to step out into that place and share the good news? The good news of who we are as sons and daughters of God is because our king is alive. Every other religion, there's no God that is alive. Christ is alive. Your father wants to impart his son's life into you that you can be. Might your end will probably not be like the end of these men and these women. But the sacrifice of your time and your effort is not in vain. The question I have this morning on this Resurrection Sunday is, what are we doing with what we've been given? Paul says this, I'm not about to let his grace go to waste. And I wanna just release over us this morning a, a word that Sean Boltz released uh, over the body of Christ for this season and this time. 
and I want to read it to us. Can you put up that first slide, please? And then I'll read the rest of the prophecy. God wants more than anything else to propel you into your assignment. That thing that you were created for, where you fit like a key in a lock. See, assignments have not ended. Yours is unique, yours is personal, because it comes from his voice. It says this, and then we're gonna pray. Sean says this, the landscape of modern Christianity is being empowered with fresh ideas, ingenuity, and reformation. The voices are emerging, new voices are emerging to give courage and boldness to engage culture and people with our faith. Even more than that, God has positioned Christians in places of influence and authority, giving us hope and new prototypes for what it means to demonstrate the kingdom of God here on earth. The possibilities with God in the marketplace are endless, far beyond the church's commonly communicated expectations of get everyone saved and love each other. God wants to bring the marketplace innovation to meet the growing needs of a, device, a diverse world to better our lives and to build thriving economies. Our responsibility to serve in every sector is the foundation of the kingdom. What if people were shown the face of God through our servitude, innovation, growth, excellence, care, and provision? This is the real world transformation that God originally intended. This is not a church-centric move of God. He's not only speaking to cultural leaders in every area of life, he's speaking to each one of us about our call to serve and to love within the marketplace. He's placing us in positions of influence, whether influence over entire organizations or industry or influence with a single coworker, so that we can bring life and light to those around us. He's giving us influence so that we can serve the world. You and I have a message. We don't have a, only have a message, we have a mandate. Not only do we have a mandate, we've got the ability and the power of God to see that and see the fruit of that. So friends, won't you stand with me so I can pray over us and I can pray for us. You can position your hearts on this day. That this day means something. This day has meant something in eternity. This day has meant something in this generation. This day in history means something so pertinent to you. This day means that I can't sit on my Christianity. This day means that I live differently. This day means that I don't live like the world. This day means that everything a part of, a part of my life is different because I live differently. This day, you got given the gift of righteousness. This day, Jesus said, it's better that I go, that I can send the one who can empower you lead you, guide you, change you, and walk with you. This day, friends, you and I are here because of those men and women that we heard of in the beginning of this message that went to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the other part, parts of this world that you and I can get to experience the risen king in personal relationship. So Heavenly Father, I thank you that each person in this place has a unique, a unique call from you, a unique influence from you. And I thank you, Jesus, that us who are believers in this room, convinced that Jesus, you are the resurrection and the life, and even though we die, we will live. I thank you that our eternity is secure because of your resurrection. I thank you, Father, this week that you can give us a mandate about our work, our organization, our sphere of influence. Speak to us on how we can be those you've mandated to be as the sons and daughters of God 
to bring about resurrection life. I thank you for your life. I thank you for your gift. And I thank you that your, your power and that your grace that you've given us will enable us to do what we can't do in our own ability. So Father, I bless these sons and daughters, us as a house, that we look at history and we see what was done. We thank you for the life that you've given us, but we thank you for the lives that you are entrusting to us in our future. And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen.